I'm Cherie and welcome to today's RIA webinar on 3D printing. This webinar is currently being recorded and will be played back on the RIA YouTube channel. So firstly, I wanna thank the RIA for hosting these wonderful webinars, which truly showcases the different RIA task forces and their members. And a very special shout out to the RIA president, Dr. Sartorius Giftopoulos. I'm extremely excited to welcome Dr. Summer Decker, who specializes in 3D modeling and printing to create patient specific models to assist in surgical planning, simulation and education. Dr. Decker is the Vice Chair of Research, the Director of 3D Clinical Applications and the Associate Program Director at the University of South Florida, Mulsanne College of Medicine and Tampa General Hospital. She holds numerous patents on medical devices developed in her lab. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Decker led a team that designed and developed a 3D printed nasopharyngeal swab for COVID diagnostics to help address the national crisis in testing due to the global shortage. This swab was used in over 56 countries. Dr. Decker was a recipient of the 2021 Champions of Humanistic Care Award from the Arnold P. Gold Foundation. And as you see, she's a very, very busy person, but when she does have time for hobbies, she likes to hang out and paddle in Tampa Bay with her dog. I would like all the participants of this webinar today to take this awesome opportunity to ask questions and interact with Dr. Decker. And if you have not already followed us on Twitter, the RIA Twitter handle is at RIA underscore AUR tweet. So now I will give the virtual floor to Dr. Decker. Thank you. And we are really looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Wang, for that very kind introduction. And I'm looking forward to talking to you all today about my favorite topic, um, actually using 3D technologies and a lot of different clinical applications. And, and this is just a sample of what we do in our lab here at um, University of South Florida Department of Radiology and Tampa General. And um, I share this, uh, my description, my job description here, because I think it really illustrates how many fields are really, really interested in this topic and, and in 3D printing and want to harness it. But I'm hopefully by the time we're done here, you'll see why it's important for it to be housed within radiology. And so that's why I'm so excited to talk to radiologists today, trainees today, because this is the future of our field. And, and I'm hoping I can uh, convince you of that um, during this presentation. Um, I have no disclosures um, of, to financial disclosures. I am on the Stratasys Hospital Steering Committee. Um, so I'll let you know that. So um, I head up a team um, here within the hospital. Um, it's myself, our medical director, Dr. Todd Hazelton, our technical director, who is a biomedical en engineer, Dr. Jonathan Ford, and a team of residents and medical students and graduate students. So there's a whole bunch of us here that contribute to this, this um, within our facilities. To those of you who are familiar, and most of us here, we're all in medical imaging, um, you're probably familiar with 3D modeling, and we can use 3D models across all disciplines. So I don't have to sell people on uh, what 3D models are here, um, but a lot of what we do in, in radiology actually translates very much back to like video games and things like that, because it is image data and it's making um, taking something from 2D to make it a 3D. So whatever we can do with a physical object, we can actually create it in the computer and then turn around and print it back out. So it gives us a lot of applications for what we want to use. The medical 3D modeling has been around for a long time and we use a lot of the same tools that they use. Like for example, I mentioned, I show Pixar, um, which has very strong radiology ties. A lot of the same software that they use to make those movies we use in our field but they just have a very medical focused um, uh, points. And so we really, all of our stuff relies on uh, medical image data. We do use some 3D laser scans when needed, but everything really, it comes from uh, all of our imaging modalities. So to kind of give you a little understanding, um, we pretty much uh, use CT, MR, uh, we have used ultrasound, TE, different types of our medical imaging, but 
whatever data it actually is, it comes from a 3D um, point. So it is captured, whether it's slice data um, or 3D protocol with MR. And then once we have that data captured, we can go to a visualization, a 3D print, or even looking at different types of analyses with that information, which just really gives us limitless opportunity. And what makes me excited is, is that we're all sitting right now in one of the biggest tech transitions in radiology that's occurred since back when CT and MR were introduced, not that long ago, really. And so you're seeing fields like 3D printing and virtual and augmented reality and AI emerge within radiology. And it's a natural home for it. Um, one of the concerns, though, a lot of times is that, you know, people are concerned, obviously, about new technologies coming out and replacing old things. But what we here have seen at USF and Tampa General is that this is really what we're talking about is value added radiology, being able to take these other new technologies and apply them and give um, our collaborators across other disciplines more information from us back to them and really service these other departments within a new way that we haven't been able to do before. And so these are some of the new disruptive technologies that you're starting to see come out right now. And I can tell you, when people ask me when I got started in this field, like, what was your biggest hurdle? I would actually say the Department of Radiology, because a lot of these other disciplines, they absolutely understand why we need 3D. Oh my goodness, that, that would help me look at that surgery, would help me with this. Radiologists were like, but I don't need that. And, and it's right. And for many of you, it isn't for you, but it's for your colleagues. And it's us providing a value again in a new way. And when we are concerned about numbers and, and things, you know, not having as many scans or having too many scans, we have the ability to actually create new disciplines and kind of spread this out more. So how do we really plan for that? Well, we're looking towards the future and I, I point you to Aunt Many from the last two years. Um, Aunt Many actually had numerous articles, um, three ways to advance 3D printing and radiology and also just last year in 2020, the Aunt Minnie's winner of hottest clinical procedure was 3D printing. And I was really proud of our team to actually be um, mentioned by the Aunt Minnie's for the work that we're doing in that and also training our residents and our medical students in that. But as we're sitting here looking at the data that we have in their hands, we have the ability to translate that in different ways. And especially when you start seeing things like cinematic rendering coming out from different companies, when you look at the future of medical imaging, we are really just scratching the surface of what we're gonna be able to do and what we're gonna look like as a field of radiology in the future. So I could talk about this stuff all day, but I'm gonna talk just today about 3D printing. So 3D printing, you might also hear it called additive manufacturing or rapid prototyping. It's actually not a new technology. And in fact, some of the oldest methods were back in the 1980s and the first uses of medicine um, it, within medicine were in the 1990s. So when I hear people say, well, this is a brand new field in the last couple of years, I was like, no, not really. <laughs> but it has grown in the last few years. Um, it really, since even I came to USF, you, we've seen that we have gone from a completely research field and research applications to doing clinical applications in clinical cases. And so these are just some, a few examples that I'll go over here on actual 3D clinical printing. Now you might hear of different types of technologies within 3D printing. I'm gonna mention a few of them because some of you may have experience with them. You might have one at home, which I hear a lot of people have hobby type printers at home, but their main ones are, are listed here. So just to kind of go over just a few of them for you. This is what we call fused deposition modeling. This is probably that, that home type printer that you may see. It's a little bit like a hot glue gun, um, has an extruder and heats up um, a filament and creates a print that way, as you can see here. Um, so these will be your MakerBot type printers, replicator type printers. And there's even bigger ones that have a higher quality. The wonderful thing about these is that they're actually really reasonable cost. Um, so the FDM printers are for the most part. Um, like I said, you can have them at home and have, I have a lot of our colleagues have them for their kids, um, but the quality is really good. Um, they do not have the highest quality for um, actual medical printing. Um, they're really great for education type modeling, things like that. Now, SLA type printing or stereolithography, 
This is a different type of technology. This here I'm actually showing um, is a printer that actually uses a liquid resin um, here in a bath in this chamber. And actually whatever you have uploaded to the printer, it shoots a laser and actually prints that attached to this plate here. And as it shoots that laser, it hardens and then out comes the print. And so this is a very nice type printer to get started and also go continue with a lot of clinical applications. This is where a lot of the hospitals are at right now and using this type of printer right now. So this is a, a wonderful high resolution type printer, but a really reasonable cost type printer. Another type of printer you might see, and some of you might be lucky enough to have at their hospital is called PolyJet type printers. Um, this here is actually this large machine, so it is about the size of a small car, um, and, and they can be quite costly. Um, this is a little bit like your home printer where you have the different cartridges of cyan and magenta and yellow. It's the same kind of concept, which we have actually in, in a large chassis here. And then those feed this printer over here, and the same thing, you upload a file and it prints out what information you've given to it. The beautiful thing with this is that you can actually print in millions of colors and also in different densities. So you can actually print something that is, uh, have rigid material like bone with soft tissue around it. And so it gives you a lot of different options and you can even dial in what density. So if you, if you need to look at the shore value of something, you can do that and put that in that kind of printer. So these are just really kind of the, uh, the current areas of, uh, of medical 3D printing. Now in medical 3D printing, I will mention that we do, when we're doing our clinical cases, um, we do have FDA cleared printers and FDA cleared software. And so um, while I won't be going into the specific brands and um, names of software, I'm happy to let you know which ones we use. There are a number of different ones out there, um, but for any clinical purposes, you do need to have the FDA cleared materials. One of the really cool things that is coming out right now is biocompatible and bioprinting. This is where we have printable scaffolds and bioplastics, really being able to work with our colleagues in engineering and be able to implant into the body. Um, the FDA is really watching this area right now. Um, my team has a number of patents um, in this area, um, bioprinting. So this is really when you start taking that cellular engineering and bioengineering, combining it with the medical printing, um, this is some of the amazing stuff that we actually can do, which like in printing internal casts, if you will. So um, an exciting area that is developing right now. And a lot of the printers that we have, um, even of that I just mentioned, actually have biocompatible materials. And so you have the ability to actually go skin to skin um, or even have dental printing, things like that um, with the materials that we're using in the medical arena. Now, how common is 3D printing right now? Well, most of the top hospitals, they all have this. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later on about the 3D special interest group that we have within RSNA. But the trends are that all of the top hospitals have this and even children's hospitals, many of the children's hospitals have this in-house, like actually in the hospitals and we call it point of care. And so what we're starting to see is a lot of um, different specialties in particular stand out on who's using this. Now, this is a little bit older information, but you can see here orthopedics, ENT, vascular, hepatobiliary. I think mean, all these disciplines really are um, printing regularly, and this has grown even significantly since this was published. And part of that is because we've been able to show the benefits of this type of printing. And I'm going to show you cases that illustrate this. But we've been able to show to our administrators at hospitals that we can take surgeries and cut them down by hours, not minutes, but hours. We can actually pre-plan things. We can practice things in advance all using this uh, technology. And so what I love hearing is from my surgeons being able to say, hey, I was able to go home to my kids tonight because of the print that you guys made us for, for today. So since we are in radiology, I love that I can actually talk about the medical imaging side of this. So our biggest hurdle for a good quality case, for a really strong case, is the image quality. I have stuff sent to me from other hospitals that they didn't have the intent of 3D printing, for example, can you guys do this? And I've got an MR that's at five millimeter slices. The answer is no, uh, I, I can build you a Lego. Um, and if we wanna look at it that way, but the image quality really hampers actually how we can um, do a 3D model. 
And so this is really the most important factor in your print quality. And myself and my colleague, Dr. Ford, actually did a study um, looking at where do you have that anatomical fidelity loss um, when scanning. And we found that it's about 1.25 millimeters or below. So we actually work with our techs here. They know to capture that raw data for us um, and actually send it to us um, before it is purged from the hospitals. So even our surgeons have been well trained now to let us know when that case is coming in or has been scanned so that we can capture the thinnest data as possible. Also, of course, if there's artifacts or things like that, it makes it very difficult for us. So here's an example, actually, just to kind of show you the loss that we're talking about. So here is um, a, a normal head scan. Here's our 0 0.625. Here's our one millimeter. Here's 1.25. And if you really start looking here in the orbits, in particular in the, in, in the maxilla here, you're starting to see just a huge loss of information. Here's 2.5 millimeters and here's five. Now that may not mean that much to us in, in radiology, but if you're you know, responsible for rebuilding that orbital floor, it makes a difference in the quality getting out to them and how certain they are about what that print was able to give them. And so we can see here just that same image loss um, depending on scan quality. So slice thickness, image quality, very, very important. So the first starting point of a 3D print actually comes, as I mentioned, from medical image data. And so like we use CT, we use MR, we use ultrasound sometimes, we use TEE, we use a lot of different information and can even combine them in the same scan. We have often CT and MR or a CT and a TEE together. And so we're able to go in very much like in a workstation uh, radi radiology workstation and do the segmentation and really highlight the structures of interest for our, our colleagues who are whoever's requesting. And from there, this is a given example again of pre and post uh, um, looking at the imaging. You know, we, we, I do a consult with them and we look at the scan and say, okay, over here, this looks fine, but over here, I can't see a lot. And one of the things that I'm very funny about in our team is that I never want to make up anything. I don't do art, I do anatomy. And so when we're in there, we do not do anything that we can't see. It is, you know, being, as you all know, in your fields is being pushed to do, to say too much. And we don't feel comfortable with that. So if we can't see it, we can try to do everything we can to reduce the noise, to come up with something, but we're not going to do art. And often, you know, you probably all heard it too. Our cardiology fr friends are like, why can't we go down a little bit, you know, further down on that vessel or something? If it's not there, we can't see it. We aren't going to touch it. Um, and we're very, very steadfast about that. And so here's an example of a model that one of my residents made of one of our cases recently. Actually, this is a case from the last day. Um, so we thought we'd show this to you guys. And so once we create that 3D model, we actually can, in the computer, we can send it to the printer itself. We have tons of different options here. Um, these are a series of hepatobiliary cancers um, for our colleagues at Moffitt Cancer Center, um, our collaborators. And we can then send it to print. And these were fresh off uh, the printer this morning. And so we were able to show just exactly what they kind of look at. Now, this is on that PolyJet printer. You can see all of that ink coming through here in their wires. And this is why you have multiple colors and you have different densities as well in this print. So that kind of give you an idea of the quality that you can get out of here. There is post-processing involved. Um, they don't come out perfect and pop out like a popcorn and like Shrela. Um, you do have to clean them up. And so this is one of our medical students this morning cleaning up of the print, trying to be very, very careful not to knock off any important structures for our surgical teams. This is our chief resident here, and he's actually inspecting it and inspecting quality, make sure everything looks right and that is cleaned appropriately. And here you have some nice clean um, prints um, just showing how nice. This is actually for um, a specific patient where they actually in advance um, will practice the tumor resection and visualize which segments will be impacted um, in their approach. Um, we have done a number of cases like this with Moffitt Cancer Center with our colleagues, who is one of our teaching sites as well. And they love them because they said, I can go in knowing exactly the approach that I'm gonna take, what vasculature is there, and I don't have to worry as much. Um, and, and so it's very important for them. They, they want it very much in advance so they can know um, and practice that way. 
We also have done a, what we call rigid printing. So it's, it's hard, it's completely solid. But by doing these rigid prints like this, we can actually put things into segments as you see here, and they can actually inspect each segment and, and look at it this way. This is really great for education type printing and also for training residents um, and their fellows. Um, and so they, this is some of the times we get that request to do that and do it this way. Now, one of the things I think is most important about 3D printing is not just our training with our residents and our fellows and our physicians, but also with our patients. And so I call it true informed consent because we're able to take that case to a patient and explain to them their cancer, explain to them the, the surgery that they're about to have, the trauma that they've had, and, and really have them understand going in. So again, radiology, we aren't the ones often doing that, but for the teams of people that are, this is really invaluable. And this is a new story here from actually um, in May, where we were able to take one of those liver prints and put it in the patient's hands. And she said, I finally understand actually what's going on and what I'm about to have. And it made me feel more confident going in. And to me, that's some one of the biggest values is having people really understand what is about to happen and having that as the discussion tool. And then exciting thing for me is for us to be here in radiology and be able to provide that and them know like this is what radiology is able to give you um, that information. And so it, it's been a wonderful thing to watch. So now I thought I would talk to you a little bit about some of our, uh, our different types of cases that we have done. Um, and just kind of, I know we have probably different types of radiologists here or trainees, and maybe you're interested in going in an area and wonder like, does this apply to my field? So hopefully I hit a good number of you guys. I will tell you all of our work, and this is you know true of all of radiology, of course, but this field is very interdisciplinary. We sit in radiology and we work with every department within the hospital because they wanna to come to us on visualization or data or a 3D print. And so I love this image because this is actually, I give grand rounds for all of the different surgical uh, departments and ENT, the trauma teams. And I come in and explain how we in radiology can help them. And they love it. They want to learn about the technology. We actually work on how to manage their expectations because we've all experienced surgeons going, but I want it right now. And they think like it just pops out of a printer in five minutes, like your home printer. And it doesn't. And so we can actually, I've had them say, can I get that by noon? And it's nine o'clock in the morning. You're like, no, <laughs> you can't. But once they get the hang of it, when they need to order, now it is like clockwork. And so I'll talk a little bit about that in the, in the middle. The exciting thing from that also is now some of the other departments, when they have faculty candidates coming in for their department, they ask me to interview them and show them the lab because they use it as a recruiting tool to bring faculty into their departments so that they can work with radiology. And we've also not just clinically, but worked on a lot of different research opportunities that have arisen from these clinical cases. So we have many joint uh, publications, many uh, grant applications that have happened merely because of these clinical collaborations. Um, this is an example. Um, USF is actually partnered with five different facilities, one of which is Johns Hopkins Old Children's Hospital in St. Pete. And so for their hospital, we do their cardiac um, cases. We also do craniofacial um, cases uh, for their craniofacial um, reconstruction team. This is an example of one of their cranial synostosis cases where they were able to print this for the patient's family so that the family could understand how they were going to have surgery, why they needed to have surgery, and what the potential outcome would be. We also have been able to do pre and post um, surgery reconstruction comparisons for them so they can see, you know, how did that um, matter, what shifts have happened, things like that. And so we really can provide them information that they've never been able to have before, and, and they absolutely love it. On the trauma side, um, trauma is probably one of our biggest um, users. They call us to be able to look at um, different implants inside the body. Um, we get all kinds of different cases from them. Um, like I said, probably one of our heaviest users. Um, the biggest uh, thing that we see from trauma is a lot of the craniofacial, really complex craniofacial reconstruction type um, cases that come in. Um, this is an example here. This is a patient that unfortunately came in from an attempted suicide. You can see where the bullet came up and went through right here into the frontal bone, um, shattering the maxilla, part of the zygomatic and the orbital floor. 
what we were able to do because the other side of the scan was completely normal. So we were able to create a model of this side of the, the skull and actually create a mirror image of it. So take it and flip it and register that back to the, the shattered side. From there, we were able to 3D print that and they were able to take this into surgery, scrub it in. We have the, uh, this is biocompatible material. They were able to scrub it in. And then what you can see here is them actually taking their, their um, kind of pre-bent plates that they can heat up and bend. And they bend that straight to the 3D print here of that patient's actual anatomy. They can actually take the fragments out of the face um, that they had here and then use those with this heated up materials and, and really sculpt to the print itself. When I talked to the surgeon about this case, um, it was actually a New Year's Eve case. Um, he said, this is a normally an 11 hour surgery. I have to go in there and clean all of that, those fragments out. I have to pull everything out, try to put it back together, glue it back together, wire it back together. By using this 3D print here, they took that 11 hour surgery down to three hours. And so he's the one who called me and said, I'm going home to my kids tonight because of what radiology was able to do. And those are the calls that I like to hear. And not only that, but you can see here um, where this patient um, here, we've been able to do the reconstruction. And actually one of the things they commented was um, because this would have been a very complicated case, it would not have necessarily had the greatest um, uh, visualization, you know, the real um, aesthetic output from it. But by using her own face, we were able to basically mirror image her face and she is perfectly symmetrical now. So it, it was something that provides an added benefit to that patient. So this is something that we do a lot of. Um, unfortunately, during COVID, um, Tampa Bay, we are home of what we call Florida Man. You may probably have heard of him. Um, Florida Man does crazy things. And so throughout COVID, we were getting lots and lots of trauma cases um, and where um, shattered faces from car crashes or a cinder block to the face, um, someone using a cigar, a, a firecracker as a cigar and blowing their face. Um, all different types of things. And, and so we get lots of calls for these. So this is just an example of some of the work they're able to do using these 3D prints and actually um, really save time, time under anesthesia. They said not only that, they are able to save surgical tools. And so there's just an all around benefit and also the patient not being under and the risk of infection and everything. So they absolutely love them. It's not just the actual anatomical print either. We are able to do surgical cutting guides. And so this is an example here of one of the cases that we had a couple months ago. And so here is an actual, the uh, anatomical print, but then we've created a cutting guide that they can actually cut and saw on. Here's another example. I get a lot of, believe it or not, clinical veterinary cases uh, with the same requests. So we can pre um, drill holes um, for them so they know exactly where to attach their hardware and are able to create really customized surgical cutting guides. Again, all from radiology data. Here's a neurosurgeon um, surgical application. This is an example of a CT and MR um, here so we can capture all of the, uh, the vessels and all of the nerves. Um, you can even see here the print going into the mandible and coming out so we can actually inject that with paint, which is what we've done here. And so the paint kind of fills that empty space and comes out. And so all of this stuff provided to our colleagues. This is one of the uh, cases that's very interesting to me. One, because I call it a history of radiology in an image. We've got plain film, CT, 3D, and 3D printing all going on in the same image. But this is actually one of our colleagues from across uh, the bay. He's a patient himself, but also a physician, and was having a complication that um, directly impacted his ability to do his career. Because he had heard of our team, he brought himself over to have his case reviewed by us. And you can see here in the spine, and we were able to 3D print it. He was dead set on having surgery, um, knew that that was gonna be what he had to have. And then when he held the print um, in his hand, he knew immediately he couldn't, he saw where the issue was and it was inoperable. But watching him kind of go through that process, standing in front by holding his own anatomy, that's where we saw this is really something special and something different. Um, our probably number one application that we do is cardiac um, imaging and uh, cardiac modeling. Um, these guys, they use this a lot. The Heart Institute of Tampa General uses a lot. In fact, 
we are currently the front page of their flyer, even though it's a different department, um, the 3D printing is what they advertise. And so we are able to do not only like flow dynamic and what to show them what exactly complications might be going on here virtually, but here um, we can actually help them with our interventional cardiology team um, be able to practice on really a difficult cases. This one was a mitral valve leak. And when we were in the heart team meeting, they had estimated that he had a 0% chance of survival without intervention and with intervention at best 40%. But because they had the 3D print in their hand, they said, we're gonna try it. And so they went, and as you can see them here, trying to practice um, what wires to use, what size wires to use, what amplats or device to use, what size to use, everything known in advance before they go in. And then I stand over the shoulder of um, my colleague here with the print and talk them through what we just worked out. I love this case because you can see here the exactly what we were just practicing. And what you see over here with this uh, on the right, the high spikes, that was the internal heart, uh, heart pressure before and the low ones are when it stabilized after deployment. And what was so exciting about this is that when that happened, the, the cardiologist, the interventional cardiologist looked at the room and he said, look what radiology did for us. Look what they gave us. And I was the only one from radiology in the room. So this is what I'm trying to help is that I want you guys to start hearing that. And I want my residents to hear that. And that's what's exciting is because they're seeing how they can be valuable in different ways than they ever dreamed. But I would tell you this and it sounds, you know, like, wow, you heard that. But I thought, listen to them, let them tell you. So I'm going to um, show you this um, here. I'm going. Uh... So this is my colleague and I'll let him tell you. I had a test run. Dr. Matar has been working as an interventional cardiologist at Tampa General for over 25 years. Now he won't work on a complex case unless he has a 3D print. And the good thing about 3D modeling is you can actually apply devices that you normally use in humans on a true anatomical representation of that heart and see how they interact with other structures. Dr. Matar recently received a print of a current patient I had a test run. Oh, sorry. Dr. Matar has been working as an use in humans on a true anatomical representation of that heart and see how they interact with other structures. Dr. Matar recently received a print of a current patient with a hole in his heart. This right atrial disc right now is not seating properly. He was able to perform his procedure on the heart without bringing the patient in. So that's why we decided to change our strategy based on 3D modeling. So like I said, you don't have to take my word for it. You can hear my colleagues. And when I heard that on the, the nightly news, I looked at my residents and I said, that's job security for you guys. When a surgeon will get on TV and say, I can't do it without radiology. So that's where we're sitting. We're sitting at such an important part of being able to be so valuable. And that's why I don't want radiology to disregard this field. So here's another example that I think really illustrates an important thing that people need to keep in mind, especially from radiology, about 3D printing. This here was actually a last minute request that I had one night. Um, we, this was a patient that was coming in to have his entire side of his lung removed, just 36 year old male. And they had already decided how they were gonna approach this. But our chairman, who is a pulmonary radiologist, is a chest rad, he came in and he said, I really was hoping that we could maybe look at this because I think we don't need to remove the whole lung. The scan had showed a carcinoid that was potentially through the bronchus wall. But it was really unclear when we were looking at it if the entire lung or just the lobe could be removed. Um, so we started looking at it and we realized the scan couldn't tell very well whether or not it had invaded the wall or if it could actually be lifted and removed. And so I printed it overnight at 6 a.m. We handed it off to the uh, lung cancer team and the surgeon just looked at it and he, he called his nurse and he said, run this to the patient. We're going to make a different approach altogether. And so not only we used it for patient education in that moment, but also pre-op planning. But what I sat there and realized was that the surgeons, they kind of believe that this print is like the gospel according to anatomy. 
And we had to get them to understand that the scan is what that print is. The print is a representation of the scan. And so I think that that's really important to understand. And it sounds synonymous, but it's not. We can't tell if he could lift up that carcinoid or not and, and remove it. It could be through the wall. It could look differently when you get in there but they want it to be exactly as it is. And so we have to make sure that they understand if the scan can't tell, the print can't tell either. And so we are limited by the scan. And so here's another example of a cancer application. Um, we had a, a number of cases here. Obviously we have an older population here in Tampa Bay, but we also unfortunately see a good number of pancreatic tumors. Um, here and even young people. And so this was a series of prints that we did for patients, um, for their surgeons to be able to communicate their surgery with the patient. And we submitted this for um, the uh, putting a uh, patient's first award with Canon Medical Sim uh, Systems and actually won the national award for using technology in radiology to help patients in a different way and, and really having them understand their case understand why they aren't able to eat, why they're struggling right now. And so this is something that we're probably most proud of is being able to see that we're helping directly, not just our clinicians, but our patients and they understand it. And, and really, they really do. They love holding their own stuff. And when you're in a situation like a pancreatic tumor situation here, showing them a grayscale model of a 2D image does not help a whole lot an 80 something year old patient, but showing them and having them hold it in their hands and really walking through them does a whole lot more. We don't do, as I mentioned here in just a second ago, we don't do just humans occasionally. We do actually get asked to do veterinary um, clinical work. So this is actually one of our um, a situation where we had a patient who was a baby manatee a couple months ago. Uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife um, had uh, received this uh, case actually as a boat strike. They knew who had done it and they asked us to actually document um, the trauma in this case. And so this is the actual CT scan um, here. And as you go through the scan, you'll be able to see the gashes um, in the back and actually um, where the uh, lungs have collapsed. Um, you can see also fragments of the, the vertebra. Um, and so this, is, this animal was in distress. And so we were able to, as a team, create 3D models um, actually of the, the animal and calculate exactly the volume of lung loss um, so we were able to show that they only had 19% of its lung volume. Um, the rest was actually all um, a pneumothoraces. And so also we could show the fractures in the spine here and where the spine had been severed. And so this is some of the other stuff that we are able to do and provide information to other types of agencies um, in our area. So here you can see uh, where those fractures are all. So just try to show you a few different examples here, but really the applications are endless. Um, you have quantitative information, the 3D models, but we have the planning, the training, simulation, education of our patients and our trainees, medical device development, and even patient-specific implants. One of our big areas right now is clinical simulators. Our residents have been working on hip aspirations, a simulator of a lumbar puncture that we have a grant for, even um, uh, breast imaging and, and doing mammos, um, modeling the cancers, breast cancers, and being able to do the biopsies, all of these things designed by our residents. Um, so it's a huge area for 3D printing. If we can see it, we can model it and, and test on it. Um, as I mentioned, medical device development, our department, um, our team actually has about four, four to five patents. We have one that's about to go through right now um, and another five pending um, for medical devices that we've been able to create from our patient cases and actually work with our surgical colleagues. Um, this is an example of osseous mesh. So um, looking at osteoconductive, osteoinductive materials, the 3D print for our pediatric cases so that you don't have to keep going in with metal implants, but actually use a, a 3D print that we seed with demineralized bone matrix to be able to grow with the child. So really cutting down on the operating um, overall. And um, as Dr. Wayne kindly mentioned, one of the biggest things that we've been able to do and has um, filed for patent on, this past year we actually um, saw that there was a national and international crisis for um, COVID testing um, due to the lack of a 3D printed nasal swab. And so we designed one, did the bench lab testing and clinical trial back in March, 2020. 
and um, we were, moved very quickly. We were very lucky that it all worked. Um, we led a multi-site national clinical trial on this and numerous states were able to pick up our USF swab, including New York, Massachusetts, Kansas, Oklahoma, Oklahoma uh, Ohio alone had over a million of them. We have contracts with the Army and the Navy, um, the, all of these different branches of the military um, using our swab. And over 60 hospitals um, joined our clinical trial. Right now it is used in over 56 countries um, in, around the world. And here, just to give you an example, the reason I mention this is because now there's over 70 million of our swabs in the world being used, but more importantly, like on the local level, our hospital was completely shut down except for traumas. We were struggling financially, they will tell you that, and they needed to reopen. And we were able to reopen because of this in-house 3D printed nasal swab. So this has nothing to do with anatomical printing. This has nothing to do with surgical cutting guides, but this shows how the Department of Radiology was able to step up and step in and actually save a good portion of jobs and get the hospital back and up and running because we were able to pivot quickly. So just a few people in a room really, really helped the hospital. Not only our hospital, but Moffitt Cancer Center, both VA hospitals and also um, all of the USF health clinics. Um, so it was quite a, comp a, a group effort between us and the Department of Infectious Disease. But you know, for teams that are sitting in the back and kind of in the dark and everything, suddenly we were out there. Uh, the world news picked up on what we were doing and suddenly we were all over the news. I had to do 50 something national international interviews. We were in the front page of the India Times, um, all of these different news agencies because nobody had heard of radiology coming to save the day in COVID. Um, so we were really proud for our collaboration with all of our different hospitals, including Northwell Health, who worked with us on the design, and Thomas Jefferson, who was one of the first groups to sign up for our trial. So all of this sounds great. How can you guys get involved? And I will wrap up with this. So one thing I want to tell you, how do you get started? Patients actually come to our hospital for this. I mentioned the neurosurgery case. So if you don't have a team and you're interested in getting one, a lot of times the administration are like, why should we do that? You know, what's the draw? Well, I can tell you from direct experience and from experience of a number of hospitals that I can point you at, that you were able to draw on the most complex cases in that region because of having this kind of team in-house. Patients do understand it. They, they look for it, they're excited about it. So you can actually bring and have it be a draw. So are, is it gonna be a cost leader in your hospital? Probably not, um, but will it bring in those big cases? Yes, for sure. The other thing is compared to other types of research or, or starting up service lines, it's fairly cheap. Um, my chairman talks about this all the time. The hospital talks about this all the time. That's it, that's all we gotta do. And then suddenly we can be doing all of this work. It is a very reasonable upstart. There are, yes, half million dollar printers, but you don't have to start there. And there's a lot of ways of getting involved without having to uh, expend out a whole lot of money. The other thing is it's all run in radiology. It's run from people like yourself, people like me, and also a lot of our radiology technologists, our radiographers can help with the segmentation. One of the things I will mention, it is, it, it is pretty good, fantastic marketing for hospitals. Um, this was something that was not on my radar because I like sitting in the dark and working on the images. Um, but I can tell you that our hospital has been able to secure donations to be able to sustain the activities and they use it in a lot of their marketing. So I thought I would show you here. heart care in Tampa Bay, the choice is simple. Tampa General treats the region's most aortic aneurysms with game-changing technology you won't find anywhere else in Florida. We have the area's most certified hypertension specialists innovating with 3D modeling and clinical trials. And our heart transplant program is one of the nation's best because we take innovation to heart. Tampa General Hospital, other hospitals practice medicine. We define it. I assure you, I did not come up with that tagline. Um, but no, I, I want to show you, this is the hospital sees it has value and they want to put that out there. That's our national campaign. And also even in our hospital's annual report, there was a multi-page spread of all of the work in 3D and state-of-the-art radiology. And for those of us who are in radiology, um, who live as um, often redheaded stepchildren to a hospital, 
when you see hospitals get excited like this, um, it's something unique and something rare. And again, it does not have to be that big of an outlay. It is a lot of the stuff that we have already in our own departments. So how do you get um, into this? The thing that you wanna mention them, reimbursement. So as a field, we actually have worked over the last few years to actually work with the AMA on getting CPT billing codes. We were successful in that on July 1st, 2019, they went live. There are four CPT codes for this. First is the anatomical model 3D printed from an image data set, one piece of anatomy. And then each part of the anatomy beyond that is a different code. The other thing is an anatomical surgical cutting guide, which is why I showed you the opposite, what that looks like different and each component beyond that. Now, right now we came in as CPT category three. So that's an experimental category to really track it nationally, but we are currently actively working to go up to category one. How are we doing that? Well, the RSNA and the ACR are working together on a large 3D printing registry. I know our hospital is part of it and we are collecting all of the information. How long does it take to get the print? How much does the materials cost? What did we do? What printers are being used? And everything on the surgical sides too, on the application sides, who's using it? Why did it save time? All of this information is being put into a registry so that we can go back for higher um, reimbursement. Our hospital and many, many 3D teams um, have already gone live and Epic. Um, that's what we use at our hospital. Other hospitals use this different system, but it is live at Epic and USF and Tampa General. So it is alongside all of our ordering for a CT. So when my trauma team says this patient comes in and I need to order a CT, they know they want it for 3D, they order it at the same time. And so I, my job as the directors, I field the request for consults. I talk to them, what do you need? Is it a visualization? Is it a model? Is it a data? Is it a print? And, and then we can work from there. What's the time frame that we need this on? Now that means that there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and so we get a lot of requests every single day. Um, and we have to sometimes say we can't do that one. It's not appropriate. And that's where appropriateness comes in significantly. And we have been working as a field on publishing appropriateness criteria. But the other area we had to work on is training people in it. We started one of the first um, 3D dedicated rotations for residents um, in the country. And so every month I have a resident rotating with us and they sit at our hip and they do all the clinical cases. And so this is not research, but just clinical. They do from the time that the call comes in that there's a case and that we see it on our board pop up all the way to when it goes to surgery. And then they do a consult after and learn about how did it impact the surgery. These here have resulted in so many publications too, because the surgeons will be very excited what we're doing and they wanna publish it and our residents are able to get on those publications. One of the things that I've heard from our residents, one, they call it extreme radiology because we get the most complex cases in the hospital. If it wasn't complex, they wouldn't need us. So we do get a lot of really difficult cases, but also they said, we're able to act as a different role as a radiologist. You know, we live in a world where an order is put in and we we dictate a report and it comes back to them and there's not a lot of consult going on and not a lot of conversation. But that is completely different here. They are the ones driving this. They know, hey, this case would work. Um, this case wouldn't work. And so they're the ones to be able to pick up the phone and say, I think 3D would be great on this. And I, you know, if you haven't already thought of it, let's do this. Or if that case comes in, what do you need and how can we work? Having my, I have a great photo of one of my residents surrounded by neurosurgeons and them all listening to what he's saying. This was the moment that really made it worthwhile because they're listening to radiologists and they're listening to trainees. And so when they go off to fellowship interviews, when they go off to job interviews, they're being asked about this. How much training do you have? And this information that we are doing is actually going back for the radiology reports. And so it is a, a little uh, additional statement that 3D was done and this is what was done, images and everything are there. The other utilization we have, because people think I can't afford to pay for anybody. Well, we have medical students who are interested in this. And so we've been able to use them in a lot of our work. Um, I teach the medical students in radiology, so we get them trained to a certain point and then they can come in and work with the residents. They are really excited to work on the 3D prints and cleaning them up, things like that. And so we have people that stay year after year. In fact, this young lady here is now one of our uh, residents and this gentleman right here, he's applying for our program. I will tell you the last year, we've got a waiting list of people to work in our lab. 
Um, and last year, our, our program at USF, our medical school, actually had 21 applicants for radiology, which is some of the highest in the nation. And a lot of it, they said, is because they get this opportunity and, and they want to go out and, and go to other places and show it. So where can you specifically get involved? Well, you're in the right place. The AUR ha, um, RRA actually has a 3D working group. So you can go right here to the AUR's website and I am the chair alongside my colleague, Dr. David Ballard, who is here. This is us presenting at AUR together. He's at Mallinckrodt Radiology and we will have shared resources and online training. And this right here is actually part of that. So this is a webinar. So I'm very grateful to the RRA for letting us present. But even when we're in person at the um, AUR sessions, we hold round tables so that you can come up and ask us questions. I've done um, consulting for lots of different hospitals and medical schools from the AUR and RRA. We're happy to always answer questions. So even if you're not a member of the RRA, I really strongly suggest you join and um, come talk to us. We actually wrote two papers for academic radiology, white papers, one, the clinical applications, and two, logistics of 3D printing, how to get involved, how to get started. There is also the RSNA 3D special interest group of 3D printing. Um, this is a, a whole, basically, it's kind of the entire field in one spot. So we have committees on all different things on appropriateness from billing to all these different areas you can get involved. I actually had up uh, one right now on education so that we can get residents trainees involved. We're working on certification and international training. So please join us over there. And that's within RSNA. So in conclusion, 3D technologies, this is just growing significantly in the field of radiology and it's important for it to grow within radiology. There's really, as you hopefully have seen, unlimited applications for research, for clinical, um, even education and innovation, but we need more. We need more research. We need to see how we can apply it to different things. One of the things that I'm really focused on is getting our residents and our trainees and our radiologists of the future involved in this so that we really can push it to areas that we've never even thought of. And also that trains them not to be afraid of the next big technology that comes out, that next uh, technology disruption. They're not gonna be afraid because they've seen things like this. So appropriateness and teaching them about how to utilize this. And I hopefully um, by this have shown this is why this belongs in the field of radiology. And so I have had a number of people in radiology when I first RSNA be told, don't come here. This is not a field for us. We don't care. It isn't necessarily for you. It is for our colleagues out there. But what it is for is for us to take the information that we look at every single day, package it in a different way and give it in a different way to people that really, really thrive using it. So instead of handing off the field, we are the medical imaging experts. We're the ones who should be reading this, the most complex cases. And so we shouldn't hand this field off. And so this provides a really, really unique opportunity to the field of radiology to be value added. It's a new way of helping our patients. And it's also a new way of future proofing our field. So I wanna thank you all for coming to listen to me. We're always ready to uh, collaborate, contact us here. Um, you can contact me here at my email. Um, I'm also on Twitter. So if you wanna reach out to me, we're happy to answer anything. And with that, I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Decker, that was amazing. I felt like I learned so much and my perspective on 3D printing and its applications has expanded just by that um, talk you gave. Um, we do have one question and the question is, do you accept outside institution residents for your 3D resident rotation? And do you have a 3D fellowship for radiology as well? Um, if not, will you have one in the future? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so we have been um, receiving applications from external uh, groups. And so we are open to taking external residents. It's actually why we started it. We got so many requests for other hospitals wanting to send their people here that we wanted to use our residents, you know, as the first pass um, for the last couple of years. And, um, but so the answer is yes, um, we can work something like that out. We are working towards a fellowship. I will tell you that um, I believe the University of Ottawa had a fellowship um, with this with Adnan Sheik. Um, who is the current president of the RSNA 3D SIG. He is uh, now out in Vancouver. But so there is some um, opportunity out there. But um, to be honest, there isn't a lot of uh, postgraduate, you know, GME training. So that's what we're trying to change. 
So if you are interested, let me know and we'll definitely try to work something out. And I had a question. I know we went through some resources. Um, would you direct people who have absolutely no experience and no um, current 3D printing expertise at their institution to just join with the RSNA, RA, and um, ACR? Absolutely. Um, I'm not as familiar, to be honest, with the ACR's applications, but I know with us within the RRA, we have this group, we have people that are doing this every day, and we will help with the most I've had people say, this is a silly question. There are no silly questions. I'm happy to answer. I've had people call me and say, could you talk to our, our quality uh, team here at my hospital? Could you talk to this group? Could you talk to my billing person? Happy to do all of that. And so we are happy to consult in that capacity, but also the really great resource is the RSNA's 3D SIG, um, because there there's a discussion board. So you can find out more about articles coming out, um, upcoming conferences, and I'm really excited as I head up this um, 3D um, interest group over here in RA, we're going to be working together. So there is, um, thank you, Frankie, uh, there is a separate um, application fee um, for the 3D SIG. So I think it's a really, if you want to learn from the top people like Dr. Rubicki here, who is uh, now I'm all like flustered that he was on the call. <laughs> Because he knows so much more than I do. But if you want to learn from the top people like him, join this group. Because what I found as someone who's young in the, um, in the field, um, when I got started, was that people are so willing to collaborate and share and everything. And so it's a real, it's kind of like another family. And I can tell you, when I, we were going through the 3D swab situation, I, that's the first place I went, was I went to the discussion boards of who wants to work together. And that's where our collaborations came from. And so um, I'm really grateful for that, that 3D family. So I, we are welcome, anybody who wants to come, but that's what's exciting is the AUR and the RS today are gonna work together on this. And cause we wanna be the home here, the RA, the place to come for training too. So we will have um, joint um, things going on. So um, speaking at someone's asking about a reduced free, uh, fee, for residents, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, Dr. Rubicki might know, but I believe it's $40 for um, the application fee um, to be a part of the SIG. It definitely is worth it. And also these are the people walking into the AMA and saying we need these billing codes. So that's, you know, this is that lobbying group that we need. Um, so being able to be part of it, and it doesn't matter if you're a resident or, you know, whatever place, they will get you involved. Thank you, Dr. Rubicki says the fee largely goes back to the SIG for the meetings. And when I when we say meetings, if you'll go to RSNA, usually there is a large portion of the technical exhibit that is really set up with all of the print companies. And we have a special stage at RSNA where you can hear technical talks, but also even over in the education pavilion, specific um, exhibitions on 3D printing there and applications. So they do a lot at RSNA and it's, in fact, we start probably that Saturday and go the entire time. So um, it's definitely um, worthwhile. And my last question, since we're nearly time, is from an educational perspective, have you found that the residents who went through the 3D printing um, rotation, do you think afterwards they have a greater appreciation for just radiology in general and imaging? One of my chief residents last year said to me, he said, I had gotten so used to being a report going back to, you know, and not knowing what happened with that case. He said, I feel more connected and involved in the case. I feel like I have more of a role and I see what the future of my field is. And I have residents, I'm the associate program director for our residency. I interview med students and I hear about like, aren't you afraid the field's dying? And I hear this from med students. And I said, we're more valuable than ever. What are you guys talking about? Because I see this and see my residents involved in this way. And so the idea that they are seeing new ways to be radiologists so that the future is really bright for them. And they just have to really embrace technology and not be that afraid of a new thing. And so I think that when they go off to fellowship and even in private practices that they've gone off to interview for, they're being asked about it. Oh, you're from USF, therefore you must have training in this that makes them more excited and, and they really see the value. So again, one of them said it's extreme radiology. Again, if they if it wasn't complex and hard, they wouldn't need our help, um, but it makes it so that you're a much stronger radiologist um, in that regard too. So I do have to, you know, we don't let them overlap. We want one resident at a time in there 
really learning from the time the scan is done, how the capture is done, why it matters, all the way to how to clean the print because we, they should know how that works and be able to manage expectations. So I think there's a lot that they can learn from it, but also take out in their career. So I'm excited some of them are now our fellows and they're turning around cases for us. So. Well, excellent. Thank you so much um, for this wonderful session. I've learned so much and I want to thank everyone who joined us on this webinar as well. And thank you to the RA for sponsoring this. Well, thank you all for attending and I really appreciate it. Again, please reach out if you have any questions. I'm definitely happy to answer.